everyone. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Welcome. We've missed you so much, and we're very happy to be back with you today. Uh, Dr. Rick Stevenson, our weekly guest, he is an African American history professor at the University of Florida and a professor of African studies. Dr. Stevenson, welcome back. How are you? I am well. I am so excited to be back. I've missed you guys. What's going on? That intro is through the roof. Oh, well, we'll have to thank our staff. <laughs> well, please let them know that, um, they did it to the max. I will. I will they share that it. with them. It's always good to let people know how much they appreciate it. That's right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We certainly appreciate you and uh, what you are bringing to us. And today on this show, we're going to be talking about something that um, most people have never heard of this story, the overthrow of the government of 1898 in Wil Wilmington, North Carolina. Yeah, it's, um, it's the only coup d'etat that has ever taken place on American soil. And as the climate is today, it makes it, it is very concerning uh, in light of the um, kidnapping that was planned for the Michigan uh, governor as well as the Virginia governor, I can believe. You believe it? Uh, no, can not really. You it's it? it's unfathomable. And um, so before we, as we always do, we uh, like to go to the source. Yeah. For all that we are and all that we can be. And in all that Dr. Stevenson uh, does, he is also a theologian. So, sir, if you would take us to the master, our creator in prayer. Please, let's pray. Lord, we are once again honored. We <clears throat> had a vacation from this time, but we are grateful that we are back. We pray that all that we do and say tonight brings you glory and honor, but also brings liberation opens the minds of those who have been uh, less fortunate educationally, that they might recognize that we have to get out and vote. We have to get out and take care of ourselves because uh, there's something awry and we need to be prepared for it. But we need your presence. We need your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you very much. Dr. Right. Stevenson, there is uh, the image, the propaganda that exists in the United States of America and so much of that propaganda is used to help keep us divided, to Absolutely. help make sure that people don't come together and seek truth. And as someone pointed out to me, as we watch um, the news, please understand that it is not the news. It really is just some news. Exactly. exactly. There are a lot of other things that are happening. And just as we have been uh, made uh, privileged or not privileged, or we have been taught a version of history mm -hmm. that is not all of the history exactly. of this exactly. country and all of the history of the world, we must understand that there are authors to these books and it gets slanted based on who the author is and what story they wanna tell. And so tonight we're gonna to take a look at the a government overthrow in Wilmington, North Carolina that happened in November of 1898 uh, and how it parallels to the climate that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So doctor, um, how, how did you become aware of this, this, this coup d'etat? Well, I, uh, I teach several courses in African-American studies and one of the sections in my, in my intro course is a section on reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction is the period right after the Civil War and between 1870 uh, until the early 1880s, 1890s, we have the country being reconstructed after so war is over. The South is in the shambles. Uh, Four million people, African people are set free. Uh, you have the Freedmen's Bureau, which is an organization that is in the South designed to help acclimate Africans, uh, Africans 
Americans to uh, freedom, if you will. That's why it's called the Freedmen's Bureau. And then you have these people who are voting and willing to elect black people to office. In this video, you'll see 11 African Americans in the Senate and the Congress uh, in the 1870s. Uh, yeah, and, then, and you know, which really we see, you know, in the last 70, 80 years, when we see that, you know, African Americans are being elected and the history books make it look like they were never, ever elected before. I mean, it's almost as if there's a whole section of American history that's completely left out. Exactly. And, and as you mentioned earlier, it's primarily because of the people who were writing the history, right? I mean, remember now, Hiram Revels is the first African-American elected to the Congress in 1870, five years after the, after the war's over. Then you have uh, Blanche Kelso, another elected official, uh, uh, elected uh, congressman to, uh, and they're both from Mississippi in 1870, right? From Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi, right, right. And so, Black people were very clear that it was important to vote then. And because there was such a large population of Africans and Africans and uh, Africans, uh, Americans in the South at the time, they had the ability to affect the electorate. And white Americans in the South were very clear about that. And so because these white people in Wilmington did not want to be governed by black people, they uh, formed the militia. Uh, militias that we have today are not new. They've had militias since the you know early 1800s. And this militia not only took over the city, burned down the black publishing houses. There's a white woman in the video who talks about lynching black people lynching black men you have this kind of karen syndrome you know you you call the police on a on a black person they're going to be killed i mean there are so many things you'll see in the video that are uh are pertinent and that that is going on today it's almost like deja vu it's scary it's it just is. i'm sorry no it's it's very uncomfortable it's scary you know <laughs> and, and then you have the voter suppression <laughs> which we have today Right. And who's doing it? The Republicans. And so. as you will see in this video, there's such, there was a shift of the parties. African-Americans were Republicans. Right. And the Democratic Party was the party that was trying, you know, was the party of the South exactly. and in favor of uh, slavery. And there and, and black people were voting Republican because of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And. Um, you know, who was also a racist until he had to change your heart. <laughs> well, it was it was the it was the norm. <laughs> it was the and norm of the right. day, right? And for the, right, it, right, it was and, it was. And and in reality, he made an economic decision. It really wasn't about me. Exactly. It was exactly. an economic decision. Exactly. You know, happy it happened, but the reality is, um, those who were voting were slave owners themselves, but. They were trying to level the playing field between the North and the South. Yes, they were. Yes, Economically. They were. Economically. Because uh, Lincoln says this, if just give me a moment. He says, and I quote, I am not now nor ever have been in favor of bringing about any in any way a social or political equality of the white and the black races. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office nor into marriages with white people. There is a physical difference between the white and the black races, which will forever forbid the two races living together on social or political equality. There must be a position of superior and inferior, and I am in favor of assigning the superior position to the white man. He gave that in a speech uh, in 1858 in Illinois. And if if, the, if there is a group that is so inferior, why do you have to work so hard to prove it? See? It shouldn't even be an issue. I never worried about my dog, my dog Bosco taking over my house. <laughs> I wasn't worried about that. Right, right. So if a group of people are that inferior, 
Right. Why does it bother you so much that they might hold office, that they might learn to read? Why? And if they are that inferior, the question that I would love to hear answered, if they are that inferior and that dumb, that shiftless, that lazy, why did you have a war to keep them on your property working? Exactly. And remember now, they, these, these Europeans are not unfamiliar with the academic expertise of these African people. Remember, they knew about Columbus. They knew Columbus used some of the maps from the, from the rockets. They knew that botanically speaking, there are vegetables and vegetation in Africa and America that were brought here long before Columbus got here. So they're not unaware, but they're creating a system that we call white supremacy as a means of controlling what they want, their wealth. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's all that the Timbuktu report is about. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's, as they say, speak truth to power. Amen. Let's just tell the truth and then ask yourselves, there's some things that just do not make sense. And if they don't make sense, then you know, search for an answer that does make sense. If black people, if the Negro was so dumb and so stupid, why did you have a war to keep them? Mm -hmm. And as you said, um, they knew and, and people know today. And as my cousin Josette says, you have to know the truth to tell a lie. Exactly. 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 So, Doc, do you have that video? I'd like to, I uh, shared it to my page, and I'm not sure if um, I have it. Can I share my screen? Let me share a screen with you. It's 12 minutes long. We may not see all of it. But, um, and if you haven't seen this, you know, I was showing it to my husband, Scott. He had never heard of it. Really? Mm -mm. Yeah, I, I have my students. My students have to uh, watch it and then write a critique. Do you have a screen? The browser can't access your screen. Try a different screen. Hold on for a second. Let me try it again. Do it again. Share screen. Um, it's not showing. No, Firefox cannot allow permanent access to your screen. Okay, I get that. Okay, it's okay. Um, so let's just tell the story. This okay. took place November of 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina. Right. And so uh, there are at this time 11 African-Americans who are in the Congress and in the House. Mm -hmm. And the white population are getting nervous because the black population also outnumbers the white population in Wilmington. And they are fearful that these black people are going to begin to overrun the city and the government. So the first thing they do is they begin to make it very difficult for black people to vote. And they put all sorts of suppressions uh, in the voting path, poll okay. tax, yeah, so you have, let, let's look at that, the voter suppression. How does that parallel with some of the things that we're seeing today? That was November well, of 1898. Right. Well, well, one, the limiting of voting locations in various neighborhoods, uh, requiring a certain kind of ID, like in some states, for instance, you have, you have to have uh, like a hunter's license to vote as opposed to a college ID, especially in places like, you know, Georgia, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, so who's gonna have a hunting license? It's not gonna be that many black people with hunting licenses. Um, uh, making, uh, changing voting days 
and removing them off of Sunday, right? We always had souls to the polls. So you have a large number of people go to church. After church, you go to the polls. They stop voting on, on Sunday. So it's always been an attempt to control the African Americans access or people of, of color access to the electorate, especially when the party, the Republican party realized that a significant portion of these people of color are gonna vote in the same block, right? Mm -hmm. And so even North Carolina just recently was flagged by the Supreme Court because they had a laser focused attempt at restricting voting uh, in North Carolina. So it's not uncommon, it's not new, it's not a, it's not a new tactic, it's, it's a tool that they've had in their toolbox for hundreds of years. It's just that, um, you know, we, we as a country, we're not, we're not, a, not aware of it. And, and it comes from this thing called the lost cause, right? Right after the Civil War, there were four basic tenets of this of this idea of the lost cause. The first was that the Civil War was not about states' rights, that the Civil War was about states' rights, but we know the Civil War was about slavery. The second thing that goes into this context of the lost cause idea and why voter repression and so on is all connected is the glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for the cause. The United Daughters of the Confederacy helped to influence this, uh, this repressive idea by posting or building or putting money towards these monuments that constantly reminded us of the Confederacy. Because the goal is to make sure that black people stay in their place. And when you vote, that suggests equality that you're out of your place. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And so voter repression is not just about voting, it's also a reminder that we're not supposed to be equal with white America. And so when you have, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation and they started populating the prisons with uh, the newly freed Negro who couldn't prove that they had a place to live or yeah. because of a fine for something, yet, there were these other pockets of African Americans building communities, mm -hmm. thriving economically. Right. And what do you do with that? What's wrong with these Negroes? Right. Um, they don't need this anymore. They're they're and they and they're now doing better. Exactly. Than poor and, white people. And Wilmington was one of those towns. W it, Wilmington, just as uh, Tulsa. Uh, a place in Tennessee, they were all over the country. Exactly. These are just the ones in Rosewood. These are just the places that we hear about. Exactly. But the fear, the DNA of fear, and uh, has caused so many black people not to even talk about these stories. Exactly. You're right. You're right. And and what 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 I think the thing that bothers me as a historian is we constantly hear, especially from uh, a lot of Republican whites, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and everything will be fine. Well, the first thing you have to recognize, especially back in the 1800s, a lot of these people didn't have boots mm -hmm. for the first thing. But when we did pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, then you try to burn our cities down, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to Wilmington, they started putting all sorts of negative publication and the newspapers and the first thing and the most the most egregious of them all was this argument that black men wanted white women and that the southern men had to protect their virginity and the uh, integrity of white womanhood and so this this one of the one of the black publishing houses wrote a rebuttal and said some of the problem is not that black men want white women but that these white women find black men attractive. Oh no. It's in the newspaper. Oh no, so, that couldn't uh, possibly be true. Yeah, and that's when they began to write the White Declaration of Independence. I'd be willing to bet you a dollar to a donut that most people never knew that in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was a document called 
the white declaration of independence and they said in the newspaper this is a white man's country and we are not going to allow anyone of african descent to give us leadership that's why it took 90 years before another person was voted into the congress uh, 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 since 1898 and so because this is the fact that these black people were in uh, leadership roles in their communities and in politics that was left out of the history books completely so 90 years later when black people started being elected it looks like it's the first time exactly exactly that's why it's so important uh, that those of us who are in African-American studies and so on, we do what we call revisionist history, right? Revisionist history, where we go back and we look at the exact same sources. And, and the important thing about uh, revisionist history is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to re-identify and reinterpret the accounts to ensure that all of the pieces are taken into account, right? We have to make sure that that when black people didn't own their own publishing houses, especially when it came to textbooks, that what was published from a primary source, the entire narrative was given. And we're constantly reconstructing and deconstructing what has already been written by history. There was a woman who wrote a rebuttal to the black uh, article I told you about, about the white women liking black men. And she said, that if it's necessary to lynch every black man in the city, we need to do that to protect white womanhood. So what do we have? We have the Karen syndrome, right? We have this white woman who knows if she says she's in danger of a black, of a, of a black man, the white men are going to come and rescue her. So, you know, all we're seeing is, is um, uh, history repeating itself. Uh, George Orwell said, he says, those who control the past control the future. Mm. When you control the narrative in the past, you can also dictate what the future will look like. And also, isn't it ironic, while it, it would appear that white women were so revered and that that was the reason that you're gonna kill black men because of white women, when in reality, white women weren't even thought of that highly. See? <laughs> That's so why we're not able to vote. They themselves <laughs> were not able to vote, yet they were being used as the reason I'm going to kill black yeah. men because of these women that we don't even think highly enough of to allow them uh, the opportunity to exercise their rights to vote and to uh, walk on their two legs like humans as well. Even in, in Virginia, in coal mining countries. Mm -hmm. I went to the coal mine at one uh, um, uh, a company store, and the historian there said that white women were not even allowed to go in the same door as the coal miners because they were viewed as bad luck. They were viewed as being bad luck. So it's ironic that white women are being held up, that we love them so much right. and we want to protect them, and we're going to kill any black man that does anything to them, yet you're abusing them. Yeah, it's a Just smoke screen. Amazing. It's a smoke screen, and not only that, not only did, did they oftentimes not find them attractive, but if they, if 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 the white women were so needed, if the white women needed so much protection and they were so fine, then why were so many plantation owners down sleeping in the plantation with the slave women? Well, we're going to have to get one of them on the show and ask them that question so that we can get an answer directly from the <laughs> horse's mouth. And so all, all we want to do is to make give you an opportunity to look at the facts and to think, to think. We're being divided on something that we should not be divided on. Exactly. We are all God's children. If we exactly. would accept that we're all God's children, but we are still being led down this path of divisiveness and hatred based on what we look like on the outside. Exactly. And it is so unfortunate. So there in Wilmington, there was the voter suppression here in Florida. Desmond Mead, who served time in jail, became a lawyer, um, worked toward felons getting their right to vote 
And now that uh, Bloomberg and Michael Jordan and some others are paying it, fines that are imposed on people who can vote now, but they now they have these fines imposed on right. them. Uh, a lawsuit has been filed to say that paying the fines of felons who don't have the money is buying votes. So the parallel between 1898 and Wilmington, North Carolina, and voter suppression today, gerrymandering, drawing lines sure. to make sure that people... And, and so they have the voter suppression. What else happens in Wilmington in November of 1898? Well, the media plays a significant role in turning the story around. Uh, the, the militia uh, comes together and there's over 2,000 white men who come into the city and they just begin to kill black people. They're burning their homes down. They're killing them in the middle of the street, the whole nine yards. They eventually burn down the publishing houses owned by a black man and the black people leave the city. And then the newspaper begins to write narratives about what happened in the city. And it shows black people with guns. It shows black people blowing up the city. It, it shows black people running through the streets with these firearms. And it argues that it was the black people who started the riot. I've heard that before. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I've heard that before. It's amazing. And when you and when you and when you look at the newspapers and it shows these black men with these guns. Drawings. Uh, now let's just these are drawings, drawings right? Because, so because it's a drawing, they can draw anything they want to. Exactly. But previous to that, there are pictures of the white men with guns. Mm-hmm standing near their horses, standing near their wagons. But when it comes to black people, because the black people didn't have guns, remember- They had to draw them. They had to draw them. Because remember there was a there was an act called, in 1740, there was an act called the, the Negro Act of 1740. And the Negro Act of 1740 prohibited black people in the South from having firearms. They couldn't have knives. If you were if you were a Native American, if you were mulatto, if you were African American, if you were mestizo, you could not own a firearm legally. Now, obviously, some people did, but for the most part, they didn't. And why did they do that? Because they wanted them to remain unprotected, just like gun control today, right? Guns are bad in the black community. Community, well. Not so much. I mean, obviously there is black on black crime, but there's white on white crime as well. The media just doesn't cover it because crimes are normally uh, crimes of opportunity, right? White people rob, rob in their neighborhoods just like black people rob in their neighborhoods. But another thing we have to take into account is the role of poverty, undereducation, and unemployment as it is uh, a force in our communities that lead people to these these crimes uh, and this kind of behavior. You know, if you, if you if you if you take a job from a person and they have two or three kids and they want to feed their kids, they're going to take care of their kids. That, that's just the folks law of nature, right? And so to always say that black on black crime is an issue without taking into account that some of these issues are based on the systems of oppression, then you're missing the whole point. And it may really and truly, just as uh, history has been uh, altered, and just as we talk about the media of that day portraying what they wanted to portray, as I said, it is not the news as um, Kimberly Mask has said, it is not the news, it is some news. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at it that way, uh, understanding that uh, there are people who are making decisions who are going to help tell the narrative that they want to tell. Exactly, exactly. Go ahead. Remember, there, there's, there's a scholar, his name is Dr. Donald Iacovoni, and he says, and I quote, white supremacy perceives the origins of the United States. Every aspect of social interaction, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries was dominated by white identity and white supremacy became the expression of American identity. In other words, when you say American, what you are saying is white. And he argues that there that he found these he found these 
uh, 300 or uh, these, these, these uh, uh, number of, of high school textbooks and pamphlets that were written in the 1800s and each of them supported the notion of the Anglo-Saxon being the true American. And so even the history books in the South promoted this idea that if you're going to be American, you have to be white. So what happens then? If you're teaching that in the 1890s and then your child lives to be, uh, he lives in the 1900s, well, then he's going to teach his child and he's going to teach his child. And so now you're just replicating this segregative idea. And the, the emotional DNA of superiority, you know, this story in, in Wilmington that I had never heard of before in my life. <laughs> um, and, and the ladies, one of the historians in the, in the video said that you used to not could go to the library and even find any information on it. You were not even allowed to exactly. research November exactly. of 1898. Exactly. Because it does not tell the narrative that people want. Exactly. And, and, you know, when I look at that fire there, when I look at the fire in Tulsa, when I look mm -hmm. at the fires of the recent incidents, mm -hmm. it doesn't even make sense. Come, think about it. If mm -hmm. a black person went to buy as much fuel and explosives needed to blow up these buildings, mm -hmm. they would be arrested before they could get out the door. <laughs> Absolutely. There is no way in the world that I believe that these fires that we see, I think I th what, it, what it looks like to me, based on historical fires, based on what Rosewood yeah. looked like, based on what Tulsa looked Probably. like, based on what, yeah, and, and Wilmington, that, that, that is not even how we think. We want yeah. justice, but we're exactly. not interested in burning anything down. That's, that's not who we are. Exactly. Exactly. Because if that's who we were, think about it, people. If that's who black people were, think about it. We would have burned every plantation down. There you go. There you have it. That's not us. We that's did not, not start not. these fires, people. Stop thinking just because black people are in the streets and white people are in the streets saying we want justice does not mean that they're pyromaniacs. Exactly. We have not historically been the kind of people to burn things down. Otherwise we would have burned down every plantation in the South and it did not. Exactly. exactly. Do you remember just recently there was a young woman, she was an attorney. They found caught a picture of her with a Molotov cocktail in her hand. She's in a car, she's about to throw it out the window in New York. And the question was, why would a young white woman with a career in law throw this Molotov cocktail out of the window of the car. And, and the point I'm trying to make is that you're right. We tend not to do that kind of stuff. We don't, we tend not to burn down, you know, buildings. But if you go back to the red summers of 1917, 18, 19, white folk all across the country were burning places down, especially places where black people live. So it's part of the, it's part of the culture of what it means to be a white supremacist, to tear it down. Right. You know, you think about Tulsa, that entire that entire city of Greenwood was burned to the ground on a mistake. Right. Well, it doesn't have to be true. Right. Truth is inconsequential when, when we're talking about this, this kind it, of stuff that's happening. Um, it, and if if you can tell a story that creates fear, and thank you to all of you all who are watching <clears throat> Facebook, YouTube, um, our podcast, listening. Dr. Stevenson and I are just talking like it's just the two of us, but we thank you. Antoinette, Antoinette said when we, you made the comment about pulling, she said, I've been pulling myself up for so long by my boots, my bootstraps are broken. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank right. you, Antoinette, for uh, watching right. and everybody else that's watching. If you have any questions, please um, put your questions in the comments and we will be glad to answer those as we continue to talk about 1898 in Wilmington, North yeah. Carolina, uh, when a group of white militia actually took over 
took over the government. Took it over. <laughs> took took it over. Um, so so you know I'm I'm I, I keep interrupting you because I want to just compare what happened in 1898 to 2000, yeah. you know, 20 and fear. Fear works yeah. wonders with people. Yeah. And especially if it's fear that already feeds into a narrative that you want to believe anyway. Right. And see, and see I see, I think that we failed to realize that race and education was connected to the Southern psychosis of white supremacy. In other words, it was not just an idea. It is a white supremacy is a culture, right? So, you know, uh, for instance, uh, the University of Mississippi, uh, it had a clause in the Constitution that said, and I quote, according to the laws of the state of Mississippi and the Constitution of the University that prohibited offering admission to anyone other than those of the Caucasian race. And that wasn't just in Mississippi. That was all across the country. So the way that you control the people is one, the people you want to suppress, you keep them undereducated. And then the ones you want to want to 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 uh, uh, support your oppression, you educate them to think a certain kind of way. They had these um, these practices called Confederate catechisms where they would take these catechisms to the kids in school and teach them how to think like a white Southerner. And they taught them these tenets. You know, you're better than a black man. Negroes can't tell you anything. These are catechisms. And they would do plays in the schools. And these kids, the, these kids are being taught by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and so on to think a certain kind of way. So when they grow up, that's all they know. Wow. They've never been exposed to any contributions of anyone else, not that it didn't exist, but that the people who controlled the publishing houses made sure that anything that was written that was contrary to this idea of the lost cause and white supremacy was not allowed to be taught in the schools. Wow. Hmm. It's just like they had slave catechisms. Do you, do you know they had slave catechisms? They, used, they had slave catechisms on the plantation. Uh, one of them was slaves must be submissive. Paul says slaves must be submissive to your master. Slaves are not supposed to steal chickens. You can't steal pigs. You cannot, you know, do this and do that. And this is what they taught these Africans on the plantation. That's one of the reasons why so many people who call themselves Christians were you know really freaking out when I, I taught in the seminary and uh, one of the courses I taught was African American church history and when I started showing these preachers these slave catechisms they were ready to start fighting everybody they saw <laughs> because these catechisms were designed the purpose of a catechism is to teach you how to think about your organization or about your religion etc and so when you start putting that into kids they grow up recognizing that that is the truth and that's the way it's supposed to be. Hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Not surprising, but amazing. So, yeah. we, so, so we have the voter suppression, the media playing a role in creating this narrative um, of, of the message of the day. Mm -hmm. And then what happens next? So well, let me let me back up a little bit. A lot of this occurred because of what they call the fusion party or the populist party. And again, we, history repeats itself when uh, we don't do anything about it. So what was going on in Wilmington, one of the reasons they had this uprising is because the well-to-do blacks and the poor whites were collaborating against the elite whites. You ready? Mm -hmm. You've got black people who have their own businesses. You have poor black people, but they're collaborating now with white people who don't like this particular party either. 
because they feel like they're being ripped off. Same thing happened with uh, uh, Baker's Rebellion in the 1600s. Poor whites, poor blacks come together and they're going to overtake the, the plantation owners. So the plantation owners say, well, this is what we'll do. We'll take the poor whites and we'll give them authority over the blacks. That way they'll be on our side and then we won't have to worry about them. And what happens is when you have that kind of that when you have that kind of trickle down, that's when white people begin to vote against their own interests, even so that they can suppress black and brown people. LBJ was asked this question. Why do poor white Republicans repeatedly vote against their own interests? He says this, and I quote, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't know you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. The same concept. Who said that? LBJ. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the former president of the United States. If you give the if you make the poorest white man think he's better than the Negro, he will empty his pockets. President yes. Lyndon Bain Johnson said that. Yes. And that's why we see, see, this is another reason why. <laughs> This is another reason why they make it so You're hard to play. get huh? Poor white people are being played. See? <laughs> exactly. Being that's, played. My, that's my I'm point. Tell you, the first time that I really, really understood that was when I was in the media and I was covering George W.'s first inauguration. So I'm there with the richest of the rich in this country. And I'm walking and I'm looking and I'm thinking, this is not about race it's about money but if you can keep class if you can keep poor people fighting amongst themselves then i'm telling you i had that epiphany and i didn't know lyndon said it i said if 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 i could go tell white people it's not about my color if if you would stop being so mad at me because i really haven't done anything to you if you would stop being so mad at me and pay attention to what really matters Exactly. That is what is the scariest thing for the exactly. 1%. Exactly. Have you um, ever heard of the Rainbow Coalition? Jesse Jackson? Yeah. Well, <laughs> some people try to say Jesse Jackson. And he kind of co-opted it. Okay. But the real Rainbow Coalition was started by the Black Panther Party. Okay. And what they did was there was a group of Hispanics in um, in uh, Chicago, and there were these, they, there were these poor white West. Uh, uh, there was a United Front against fascism, and the Young Lords. These are two organizations. They were one was white, one was Hispanic, but they were all poor. And the Black Panther Party started meeting with the young lords and with the young um, the uh, the young front against fascism. And the, these poor individuals began to develop a, a coalition to come against the elite whites in America, and they called it the Rainbow Coalition. Hmm. This group was called the Young Patriots, and the Young Patriots were poor. Uh, uh, whites from from Chicago. There were some from West West Virginia, but they were all had the same thing in common. And the Black Panther Party recognized that if we can get past our color and deal with this issue of class, we got something going on here. And that's what they did. That's how that's how the Rainbow Coalition started. That wasn't that, that Jesse Jackson didn't start that. The Black Panthers started it. And the, even the narrative that we hear about the Black Panther being a, a radical group when really it was about economics. Exactly. And, <laughs> and gonna, the Black gonna, Panther, gonna, Go ahead. And the Black uh, Panther what? The Black Panther Party is the reason we have Head Start. They were the first, those college students were the first ones to start feeding kids in the morning before they went to school. They would tutor kids and feed kids before they went to school in the morning. The reason that they did the only time 
the only time that sickle cell became a primary medical issue in the country is because of the Black Panther Party. Wow. But when you let COINTELPRO and Hoover and the FBI write the narrative, again, you have to understand that the people in upper government were they were white they were white supremacists. So they're not going to allow these lower classes to come together. They're going to constantly stoke the fires of separation. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening now. Right. All those white people who vote against the Affordable Care Act are dying right now with COVID-19. And it is so unfortunate that um, the stress of racism is killing people as well. Yes. If you would just really ask yourself, what did I do to you? Lord have mercy. Just ask yourself that question. Lord have mercy. What did, really and truly, what did a black person ever do to ever. you? And where does your anger and the, the stress, because here's, here's the reality, Dr. Stevenson, whatever feelings that you have against another person, it's more detrimental to you than it is them. Right. Even if you pull the trigger and you kill me, you right. still have harmed yourself. Exactly. Much more than the bullet that took me to my last breath. You exactly. still are harming you the most. Hatred and anger in your heart exactly. is harming you first. Exactly. So we have this community and Doc, we're, we're running out of time. We yeah. have this community and what happens um, with this group of men who go in and take over, they the mayor resigns, they're all forced to resign. They're resign. all forced to resign and all the black people leave the town and for years, black people don't go back to Wilmington. And then they write, they, the, the militia and the, and the white government, they write the white declaration of independence. And in that white declaration of independence and in their papers, they vow never to have an African person or a person of African descent and leadership in that city. And they maintain that for 90 years. Mm -hmm. Now here, here's what I want you to say. Whenever white supremacists recognize that class becomes a means of coagulation against the white elites, they raise up their heads. In 1619, it was Baker's Rebellion. And in 1898, it was the Populist Party. Now we have LGBTQ. You have poor white, I mean, poor Hispanics. You have poor blacks. You have immigrants coming together. And what's happening? White fragility. You see, white people feel like they're going to lose their power, they're going to lose their control, and they just stoke the flames of racism in the country. And now even people who would have benefited, and I keep going back to the Affordable Care Act, because there are over 200,000 people dead right now because this government has not acted properly enough, but even if they could, some of the people would not be able to afford the medication because they, they're taking their health care. And that's on the ballot. And we have to pay very close attention to that. And, whenever, and whenever, there's a whenever there's a coalition of poor people, white racism shoots through the roof. Has anybody written about why? Do you have an answer to why on that? I'll say it again. I'm, you, 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 you die. You, you, you froze. I said any, any answer to, to, you know, I, and I've said this before. I think the, 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 the mind of racism, the mind of a racist, that people really haven't had a chance to examine why they think that way, and right. the. Um, the mental health aspect of racism, because we are we are all human race. Right. And in order to hate me, 
you really are hating yourself. And so it, what needs to be addressed is why don't you love you enough that you can love everybody else too? Right, there, there's a book I would recommend that you read, I'm holding up, it's called The Construction of Whiteness. I'm using it in one of my courses now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, it's an interdisciplinary analysis of race formation and the meaning of white identity. And it helps you understand how white people are socialized to think of themselves as the responsible ones. Uh, we, we look at this idea of manifest destiny that the Europeans were actually put on this earth in order to be the leader. And But, but the boys argued way back in the early 1900s that that was unnatural because there was all there have always been more people of color on the planet than it had Caucasians. This whole idea of whiteness didn't even exist, right, uh, in the 13th, 14th century. So, you know, we got to understand that it is it is uh, uh, a way of teaching about social connection and 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 how 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 white identity is this isolated means of control of anyone who does not fit. And that is so dangerous because when you live in that, 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 that bubble of isolation, eventually you will eat yourself. And we see that because there are people who are poor, who, are, who live in places like West Virginia, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, who were expecting coal to come back, we're not going back to coal. And you, 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 you bit off your nose to spite your face. You know, you voted for a man who said, I'm going to bring something back that's never coming back. That would be like going back to rotary phones. We're not going back to rotary phones. And we're not going back to coal. But like LGB, LG, LBG said, LBJ said, if you tell a poor white man that he's better than the best black man, he'll give you everything in his pocket. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And, and these people who are supporting this divisive propaganda, uh, no doubt the one who is um, encouraging it is looking at them and passing judgment on them. There's no way in the world that he would be in their company Right. For anything except to convince them to keep him in power. But the 1% the does not have much time for people who don't have. You talk about, I mean, blue, old money really doesn't like to talk to new money. Come on now. So, so even if you have money, if it's new money, old money doesn't want to talk to you. Nope. And if you have credit card money, no. Or no credit card, <laughs> or bad credit. <laughs> credit card money. That is a new one. Credit but card. I, we have credit card millionaires. My lord. So there, have, there's some credit card millionaires that are voting and supporting this divisiveness. There are people who whose credit scores are so low they can't get a credit card. Who's supporting divisiveness? <laughs> so please understand that you would not be in the company of you this person not. who is creating divisiveness and giving you a reason to hate me, and you don't even know me. You don't know anything about me. It's just that I am wrapped in this brown skin. Exactly. And that is a problem. Please ask yourself tonight. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror of your look, uh, of your soul in your eyes and say. Why in the world would I dislike her? Listen to me. Another book you have got to read if you really want, when you mentioned the fact that the administrator leader of this country would not be having a conversation with you. There's a book entitled White Trash. Mm -hmm. And the author begins by saying, black people didn't start calling white people white trash. White people study calling white people white trash. <laughs> That's not something that we came up with, right? right. And, and, and 
And it's an issue of class. It's not just about, quote, race, unquote. It's a class issue. Like you just said, a credit card millionaire is not going to have a conversation with someone who, you know. 1%. You're no, not going to get in. You're not going to get in. And one and other book I would recommend is a book called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabella Wilkerson. Those are three books that I would recommend people get their hands on if you really want to understand how this whole dynamic of white racism and white identity as it connects to being, quote, American, unquote, really fits. Yeah, I, I am really, really encouraged by the people who are watching. Please like and share Teresa Mullins, who says that this is an amazing conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson and Pamela. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Sherry House in Jackson, Tennessee. Thank you very much for watching. Um, uh, her comment speaks to something that Chris Rock said, you know, I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's not a white person in the world that would want to trade places with exactly. me. And I'm a rich black person. Exactly. You know, the, 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 always convinced the lowest level white man that he is better than the highest level black man. There yes. are white people who think they're smarter than Barack Obama. Exactly. And he has the two degrees from two different Ivy League. Do, do you know that <laughs> Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are the only president and first lady who have four Ivy League degrees between them. There's never been a president with two Ivy League degrees and his wife had two Ivy League degrees too. Come on, talk to me. Amazing. That'll preach right there. That's a sermon right there. Yeah. You can give them an offering. <laughs> right. well, and, and it should have been highlighted. See? All the time. Yeah. All the time. But right. here again, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, and Columbia. Here again, it doesn't fit the narrative. How are we going to how are we going to talk about we'd rather talk about her behind being too big. Quit looking at it. Exactly. Or her muscles. Why she got her arms out? Fist pumping, right? Come on. It's it's a distraction. Just a distraction. It's a distraction. Just a distraction. Right. So, so these guys go in, we're go, back to Wilmington, they go in and the um, the mayor has to step down and every other person that was part of the Republican Party yeah. had to step down and yeah. they completely overtook the government and they all, um, and, and in that spot where they burned down uh, the printing house. Right. They in the video it shows that ground that nothing has ever been rebuilt on it. Nothing's ever been rebuilt there. Nothing has ever been rebuilt since 1898. Since 1898, we're now in 2020, and nothing has ever been built on that. Just as Rosewood, right here. Exactly. Nobody went back to Rosewood. You know. Exactly. Miss Lizzie is telling the story and telling the yeah. history, but nobody. It's amazing the fear and then just um the omens i guess i don't know it's, and 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 all of this stuff that is playing out right in the moments that we're talking about right today now. that uh there was an interview with a sheriff who said that the people who were uh who were planning the kidnap of the michigan governor right and virginia governor that constitutionally, they probably had more right to do what they did or going to do than the yeah, people who so. arrested them. That this is, is so a sheriff. Crazy. A sheriff said this. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard of in my life. So what what is what are we facing? Um, you know, I've I've heard some people say we are in for some turbulent times in this country, regardless to who wins. On November third, because of the divisiveness that exists, all right. of us who can uh, pray and call on the legions of angels and touch hearts and minds and help people to awaken. Yeah, help people to wake up that you have absolutely no reason to hate. That's right. It's killing you. That's what, right. How do you see all this playing out, Doc? I think, I think, I think what, well, you know, 
I think one, we obviously have to get out and vote like we like our lives depend on it. But I think we also have to take protective measures. There are some really loose cannons out here. And I think that it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That we need to look for opportunities to collaborate, to have networks of protection, to have food in our homes, to have extra water in our houses. I mean, it's, 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 that sounds crazy to me. You know that? Yeah, but you know what? There are people in those militias who have bunkered. Oh, I know. I know. But just the thing. Around I, ammo and food for six or seven months. I know. I know what you're saying. You know saying. when they're going to come to break in when they need something? They're coming right to the black neighborhood or the brown neighborhood because they're unorganized and they're underarmed. And, and as a citizen of the United States of America that we have been told is the greatest country in the world, and now we are just days away from an election and a time in our history. I mean, it's like we are on this path, like the snowball yeah. coming down the hill. Yeah. And the closer we get to November 3rd, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. You know, I, I was I was listening to a video. I don't know if you know Dr. Akinyela Umuju. He wrote a book called We Yeah, Should he came to dinner last week. Are you kidding? Yes, I'm kidding. You're always asking me about people oh, that I oh, don't know. I was getting ready to say because 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 he and I were at a conference together. He wrote a book called We Shoot Back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you are really funny because you threw me that time. But anyway, <laughs> he says in the video, he says that even when black people are interested and looking at black leaders, they have to make sure that the leader is not only trying to lead, but that the leader wants to be a part of the community. Mm -hmm. That the leader has the ability, the capacity, and the desire to build networks within the community. That they're not leading for the sake of leadership, but they're leading for the sake of survival and liberation. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I just, I'm just really concerned that even some of the people in the organizations who have been stepping up these past couple of months, allegedly as leaders, what are their motives, right? Are they really concerned about community and village survival, or are they just trying to get their name in likes? And we have to be very careful about that because we're in a very, very sensitive and vulnerable time. Well, we have been tonight discussing November 1898, there is a video that's on YouTube. I really recommend you go take a look at it. Um, yeah. Please, please have very frank discussions with all of your family members and friends, just as the propaganda of hate has been spread. Mm -hmm. Those who have love in your heart, those of us who have love in our hearts, let us be that light uh, to and our, our family and friends who may have these very, very negative feelings. Joan Stevenson, thank you so much for joining us. Your point about how the hate of others comes from self-hate. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an inside job. Mm -hmm. It really is an inside job. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some people that are hiding behind um, religion yeah. as, as their reason. Let me just um, share some breaking news with you. God is love. Mm -hmm. And if hate is in your heart, you have chosen sides. Yeah. And it does not fall under uh, spirituality connected with the creator of peace and harmony. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Stevenson, thank you for sharing with us tonight. <laughs> this has been very informative, very enlightening. Yeah. Please say hello to all of your students for I us will. as I you will. continue to teach and enlighten. We'll Trying be back. To <laughs> Trying to what? Gotcha. Trying to pay the mortgage. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Nice, nice uh, collection of books you got back there. Thank you. Thank you. I have Several here have several at school, so I'm I'm excited. I, I love I love I, I love expanding my brain. Do you know that your brain is the only muscle you cannot over exercise? 
And did you know that we only use 7% of what our phones are capable of and only 1% of what the brain is capable of? Yeah. Amazing. Isn't it? Just Amazing. Like, as smart as you are, you can be smarter. <laughs> Hard to exactly. believe. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's why we buy books, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing with Bless. us this week on the Timbuktu Report. And to all of you who are watching Facebook Live and YouTube and uh, watching the repeat of this, we really appreciate you watching and all of your support. Uh, if you would like to see this and all the other shows, you can go to our website at www.atthewellnessnetwork.org. At the Wellness Network is a nonprofit. So as you are ordering from Amazon, you have the option of clicking at the Wellness Network as the nonprofit that you would like to support. And Amazon will send a portion of your purchase uh, to support at the Wellness Network so that we can continue this kind of programming to enlighten, to educate, and encourage and inspire. Again, thank you all so much. We will be back here next yeah. Thursday at seven o'clock. And then on Monday at seven o'clock, it is our So Sisters of Wellness show. We hope you will join us for that. In the meantime, make it a great moment. Search your heart. If there's anything dark in it, get it out. Yeah. It's going to kill you first. Love, joy, peace, and harmony. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast for our entire team here at, at the Wellness. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Don't forget, there is healing at the well. Yeah. Make it a great moment. See ya.